wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming here with a great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys. Be sure to watch the video version of this. Go to youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button. Go to all of our books we're reading and reviewing on goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can see everything we're doing over there. And also... Go to, what else is there? All the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. There's just so many of them. Just put in the Chris Voss Show or Chris Voss, and you can find everything that we're doing uh, over there as well as my books. Anyway, today we have an amazing author on the show, as we always do. He comes to us, Tarek Azim is going to be on the show with us, and he's going to be talking about his book, Empower, Conquering the Disease of Fear. January 11th, 2022 came out, and we got him on the show. He's going to be talking about his amazing book and everything he does. He is uh, determined to normalize conversations about mental. His mission drives his success as a seven times world championship attending coach in combat sports, former Division I linebacker at Fresno State, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, author, and philanthropist he lives in san francisco california and he's joining us today welcome to the show how are you chris thanks so much for having me on thank you for coming on we certainly appreciate it congratulations on the new book that's always fun give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs and get to know you better yeah so tarakazim.com and on the social side i'm I'm primarily just on instagram i'm up in my game with this social media stuff (laughs) i have an an at tarak uh t-a-r-e-q there you go. There you go. And uh, so what motivated you to write this book? You know, I actually had, I really didn't have an intention of ever writing a book. I I've, I've just was on this mission around imposing this, this, this idea and this concept I had around wanting to prove the efficacy of sport and physical activity when it came to key mental and emotional deficiencies. And for years, I, I started building a ton of proof points on this ideology. Like, how are you consistently running towards not normal things? Like, what's helping with the confidence? What's helping with the insecurities? And it always had this correlation to sport. So long story short, I built a ton of different projects, initiatives, a lot of stuff for myself, where Paul Kicks, editor at, at, at ESPN, had reached out several years after a ton of my work throughout the National Football League and the UFC and so on. And said, hey, there's something always missing in these interviews. I said, what is it? He said, you're always talking about the guys and the people and the communities and the companies and so on that you work with, but you never talk about you. And, mm-hmm. and how did you get to this? And he was the first person ever to ask. And that uh, ended up turning into a really fantastic feature on ESPN, the magazine. And uh, when that feature came out, <clears throat> the reception was out of control. And it was out of control because I think a lot of people actually felt understood. Uh, and could relate. And uh, so Paul Kicks put me on the map. And one of the first to actually write to ESPN to ask to connect with me was Simon and Schuster. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And, yeah. And they just said, hey, we'd love to talk. I think there's there's a lot more here. And there's a fantastic story and book here. You have quite a bit to share. And I ended up meeting with Amar Dial, who was just an absolute game changer. And when they shared with me the process of a book and how unconventional my process was, to writing a book, I was just like, this is God sent, man. This is absolutely God sent. So that's how I got into to, to writing this book, it was my life's work, I made some noise, and the noise was appreciated. And one of the most renowned publishing houses on the planet saw, oh, yeah. uh, saw, saw some magic here, and that's what we were able to make. Yeah, we love Simon Schuster. They sent us the, just the most brilliant authors like yourself. So uh, give us an overall arcing vision of the book, if you would. <clears throat> So the book breaks down into three different segments almost. It's it's a book that's intertwined, personal, almost memoirish type, slash prescriptive, slash proof of proof of mentality. So every chapter almost starts with a story about my life. Um, obviously coming to America as a refugee and obviously the circumstances were a lot different than the folks I grew up with, but I always found a way to to make it work and achieve some of the ideals and desires. But there was a lot. There was a lot of pain and a lot of grit, and a lot of blood and a lot of just sweat that kind of went into these outcomes. But a lot of them came with a ton of mental and emotional distress. The interesting thing was, is growing up, I never considered it distress or trauma or anything. 
But the older I've gotten and the more I share the story, the more it's like, hey, this falls under this, this category. Like this is some serious stuff you went through. But then what I realized was that there's a lot of other people that also go through this and these feelings and these battles and these internal wars. So the second portion of the chapter is an example, and it's primarily an individual of actually public influence, whether it's Marshawn Lynch, whether it's Jed York, whether it's Tulsi Gabbard, whether it's Tom Cable and you know several others, about 10 chapters. I, I wanted to incorporate in, in, an individual in every chapter because they are an, an individual that a lot of society is looking up to. Mm -hmm. And these individuals actually have come into my life and into my book because they wanted to prove the significance and the value of vulnerability and asking for help. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a, a person like Marshawn Lynch or a Tulsi Gabbard or a Jed York or these types of individuals having no problem owning up to a deficiency that's preventing them from contentment, this is one of those first steps I take to helping normalize the conversation around mental health is using these types of individuals in my storytelling to help lower the waterline that that it's okay. Like it's totally okay to have these deficiencies that are preventing you from being at your optimal state. And then the, the last part of the very subtle nudges on kind of things to think about when you're going through a process. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a prescriptive memoir almost. And you've worked with some NFL greats, Marshawn Lynch, Beast Mode. What, a, what an amazing player he is. And I think he joined the Raiders in the last year or two of his play in the NFL, didn't he? He sure did. Yeah. Yeah. He did. yeah, his, his, yeah. His, I'm a big Raiders fan, but uh, it's a painful journey <laughs> we did make the playoffs this year yeah barely we squeaked that in yeah. and we'll lose next week so nah, that's a, come on i don't know man it's <laughs> tough man it's tough it's been a tough 20 years or whatever the hell it's been since brady stole the last one from us but so you have an interesting origin story let's go back to your origin story of, of where you grew up where you came from what kind of put you on the road to this and gave you the gave you put you in the place to, to be where you're at now. My, my family uh, came to America as refugees from Afghanistan. When the Soviets had invaded the country, obviously a, a, a ton of folks, including my family, were a batch that had to, I had to leave. Both of my grandfathers were extremely noble figures in the history of our country. My maternal grandfather was actually one of the key targets of that communist regime. Yeah, he's a commanding general of the uh, Afghan Air Force uh, and Bagram Air Force Base and the senior advisor to the monarchy. And my grandfather was one of the first that actually that, that decided from the monarchy not to leave. My grandfather was, you know, requested and asked, hey, let's meet at the Torkham border, go into Pakistan, regroup and come back. My grandfather's message back to the king was, let's go ahead and pack the dirt and the people we swore to first, and then you'll see me at the border. This will be the first time I'll have to di disobey an order from you. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather ended up staying uh, along with the prime minister. And uh, they both got taken, imprisoned and, and executed. Oh, wow. Uh, and my family fled and my mother and father and older sister were lucky enough to get some sort of asylum and fly out of Kabul and ended up in Germany and in, in Munich. And my grandmother and the rest of our family had to walk out of Afghanistan to Pakistan to a refugee camp. And then everybody later regrouped in Germany where I was born. Oh, wow. Uh, so we were like in a, a refugee establishment in Germany and Germany had massive open arms to Afghan refugees at that time. And we spent, you know, a good three, four years really trying to figure out uh, how to get to the U.S., where the rest of our family was in San Francisco and in New York. And we chose to come to the San Francisco side of the family. And it, it took some time, but I was two years old when we came to the U.S. And yeah, and grew up here in the Bay Area and lived in about 12 or 13 different homes by the time I was a senior in high school. Uh -huh. uh, you know, given the circumstances of our family situation, our family never really had the... Uh, the intention of ever making America home. It was always like mm -hmm. the war is going to be over. We'll go back. Things will go back to being what they were. And that reality just really started becoming a non-reality as, as time went on. And obviously, the U.S. government was fant fantastic with our setup, with, with, with housing and Section 8 and food stamps. We were able to hold, and my mom was working, you know, three jobs at a time for some cash. But again, that, that wasn't sustainable, right? It was like, this has to end because we're going to go back. A lot of our roots and our beginnings in the U.S. started there. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to America, that's exactly why. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How did that shape you? That's uh, going through 14 different homes. I moved around a lot as a kid, but not that much. I think about four or five times, but it helped me. How did that shape you as a child growing up and, and becoming who you are? I, I actually, I didn't have an opportunity to fall victim when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have an opportunity to, to be sad. I never mm -hmm. really had an opportunity to really go into the tank. I, I had very young, my siblings and I had to grow up real quick. Both of our parents were very sick. Um, you know, my mother suffered tremendously 
from some of the really traumatic experiences of what happened on their exit out of Afghanistan. And my father was diagnosed um, as a manic depressant and bipolar. Mm. Um, and obviously, as time evolved and more time away from Afghanistan and family and the unknown and the uncertainties, his mental and emotional health got really bad. And so we spent a lot of our time doing a lot of caretaking of our parents to where it was like, look, as long as we're just together, whether it's this shitty apartment in the projects to a random, like really awesome home you can get four or five months, but we didn't care. As long as we were together, that was sufficient enough. We just never really had room for victimization given my mom always reminded us what they went through to get here. Number one, number two, what happened to my grandfather. It was very difficult for us to ever really feel sorry for ourselves, given the fact that we had electricity and running water. Did that uh, propel you into uh, wrestling and boxing and football and all the different sports you did? Does, did some of that be? Uh, it, did. it definitely did. Before? It definitely did, man. I obviously coming up and obviously extremely poor and, but, but having this like internal family legacy that lived within the home, like we knew who we were. But optically, you could never see that. You would never <laughs> believe that. Uh, where we lived, what we drove, how we dressed, where we did grocery shopping, how we paid for groceries. It was very, it was difficult to actually find confidence, right? It was like this massive insecurity of, holy shit, I hope no one knows. Holy shit, I hope no one. There were points where we had to be at a grocery store. And my father used to whisper to me, and he said, hey, son, yeah, he goes, if you want to go to the car now, I'm about to pull out the funny money, which meant, I'm going to about to pay for food stamps. And if there's anyone from your school in this grocery store, you might want to run over to the car so they don't see you. Oh, yeah. um, so I lived with a ton of just insecurities, but I was always an extremely loud personality masking a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that ever leveled me out and humbled me to be okay with myself was, was sports. Mm -hmm. You know, initially started with Taekwondo, then soccer and football. And then I got into grappling and jujitsu and then boxing and kickboxing. And it, it just, I started really because the depths you take in these martial arts help you find more about yourself. And, and that's where the, the obsession with combat sports really came to play and the correlations I was seeing with the things I was hiding about myself and not comfortable with myself. There's definitely something about working out in sports, especially as a man that really fulfill you because we're natural gladiators in the way we're built and designed and hereditary. We go out and kill the dinosaur and all that sort of stuff. And so there's a real, it really helps your testosterone. It helps you I don't know. It just helps you feel more in control of your life. I started working out really heavily every day for the last five months for the first time in 53 years. And it's really changed my life and my mindset. It, it's really made a huge difference in, and also just making me feel more in control of me and my life. And I, th I think that's something more people need to tune into. I uh, totally agree with you. This is really, uh, my, it's been my life's work and my life's mission. Um, mm -hmm. which has really been showing the correlations between the discomfort of literally just imagine doing 15 push-ups to the tips of your fingers and then holding <laughs> a plank after the 15 push-ups. Like your body gets super shaky, yeah. right? Yeah, I bet it does. <laughs> you get super shaky and it's just so funny that something so simple that you can do in your hotel room, in your office, pre-game, pre-podcast, you're shaky. But just that shakiness alone, it, it, your body's still capable of doing it, but it's you actually choosing like, look, am I just going to breathe through this? Am I going to sit through this? I'm going to embrace this discomfort. What's this going to give me? This mentality could apply. But the reality is, it's funny, is physically, you get so shaky and sweaty and nauseous and all oh, discombobulated. I think about anything emotional or mental that ever happens to you never feels that bad. Yeah. It but, really steals your, your, your mentality. Yeah. But my point is that when you get that, mentally or emotionally imbalanced it doesn't physically ever beat you up and stress you that bad mm -hmm. so if you're capable of holding a shaky plank or running a four or five sprints and feeling extremely nauseous why do you stop that mentality just on physicality if you apply that mentality of embracing that mentally and emotionally there really would be nothing that would ever cause you that much pain that's true. It, it puts things in perspective. I'm still feeling the pain from arm day last night. So in 2004, you decide to go back to Afghanistan. Tell us what that's in your journey and wh why you went back there, what motivated you to go back there. And I think that would be post-U.S. post, post US invasion, right? Yeah, yeah. It was the time. Like That was the peak time in Afghanistan was that whole 04 to 08 and a half, 09 period, 2000. Um, 11 is obviously when the U.S. had, had come into Afghanistan and in 04 was like when things just started getting really crazy again. I initially went back there for some responsibilities to, to, to some family name, mm -hmm. primarily around some support to my father on our land issues. 
And, and I went there with those intentions of just going in there for the fight, letting these people know my dad is strong, my dad has a son, like we're just going to get our land back and fight these people and blah, 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 blah. And it was my senior year in college, actually, over at Fresno State. And uh, I was at a really interesting point in my life where I really wanted to, I had to make a decision on fulfilling my responsibility to my family, my family legacy. That's been my motivation of a lot of the not normality and these amazing outcomes. Or... Do I just go ignore that and fulfill my ego about wanting to, to, to pursue a career in professional sports? Mm-hmm. And I made that decision to, to go fulfill my responsibility to my family. And mm-hmm. uh, I packed my bags and May 26 of 2004, I went to Afghanistan to go stand up for my father and just be this beefcake. And mm-hmm. uh, as I got into Afghanistan, I actually realized I came there with a really bad decision and a really bad intention. Given the circumstances and the situations I'd seen from just my visit and, and, and travels from Dubai to Kabul alone, I was like, man, this is a disaster. There's no etiquette. There's no humanity. There's no basic principle of, of, of communication. Like It was very savage-like, just people at this point. And then I get into the country and I see the circumstances of the country just walking off the airplane on the, on the runway. And you look around and it literally looks like an episode of Game of Thrones. And to say that I came there to to come for something based around like a greed and a need, I was really disgusted with myself. And it made me quite emotional, actually, that I'd come there with, I've got an education. I was raised around this amazing society and community in the U.S. I got to play college football. I got to compete in in, in mixed sports and martial arts. And I'm coming to Afghanistan to add more blood and savagery. What's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. And um, right there when I got to Afghanistan, it took me about 10 minutes to actually figure out what my purpose in this world was. And it was literally wow. from that airport to our family's home <clears throat> on Chicken Street. What you're reading today started in 2004. Wow. Um, the entire Empower concept of philosophy uh, of I'm going to utilize sport and physical activity to reconcile peace mm-hmm. uh, within individuals and communities began right on that drive when I realized this is why I was brought to Afghanistan. And this is mm-hmm. why I got the experience and understand what I understand around sport and physical activity. And my first, I would call it case study, began with um, youth initiatives. I started immediately in that country with just neighborhood soccer programs. Yeah. And you found there were countless children living in the street waiting for inevitable recruitment into terrorist networks and anti-peace militias. And this is where you find your purpose. Yeah, yeah, look, it, it was and still is. It's a very active and, and easy community to manipulate, which is the kids and the youth, because there's zero, there's nothing else to look up to or look up for or look to. There's not commercials there about academic institutions or college sports or art or music, or there's nothing out there being marketed other than you either will be extremely poor and live in poverty, or you come join these horrible militias and mm-hmm. get paid a couple grand every time you go shoot this, this Scud missile at this convoy. So for these kids, it was like, okay, that's what I have to become because that's how I'm going to feed my family. Wow. So these kids were foaming, and they still do. Honestly, when you give them any sort of time or directional alternatives, options, these kids foam at the mouth um, mm-hmm. for just a chance to know something else exists. Yeah. And, and I, I imagine I, since a lot of them are, don't have parents, maybe, they're living in the streets, they don't have good parental directions or parents. Or I imagine now that Taliban's in control, a lot of girls can't get education either. Without all that, you I mean, what direction do you have in life? Yeah, look, it's it's... You and I can easily, you know, and a lot of us on, on outside of a, a place like that could always say the word good and bad, right? Mm-hmm. Parents, for example. But when there is no standard to it or, or teaching of it, mm-hmm. for them, it's, this is just parenting. For us, it might look like it's good or bad parenting, but out there, that's just how parenting works. Mm-hmm. You, you have kids, you try to have as many as you possibly can. Wow. And then these kids go out there as, 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 start as, they, as soon as they can start working or walking. Like you put them to work to start feeding the family. Wow. And that's a very new thing. Afghanistan wasn't like this pre-79. Afghanistan's gone backwards about two or 300 years in the last 30 years. Ever since, the, obviously, in 79 when the government froze and religion froze and academics froze and economics froze, Afghanistan also froze, but then it went backwards. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a bit of a disaster. But again, I just found my hook and my way, my platform to communicate any sort of direction on stimulating thought and value and acceptance was literally happening through, through elevating their spirits and then say, great, everybody take a knee. And then boom, mm-hmm. relay a message, relay a thought, relay a challenge. And just really starting to educate like humanity and human technique, basic human etiquette and tendencies to these young kids and, and incentivizing them by... There's soccer practice again tomorrow if you answer this question, right? Yeah. 
or, hey, we're going to ice cream at the park on Friday if you guys come 10 times in a row. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really, it was interesting, man. It really showed the appetite that these kids had if, and then people of Afghanistan had to actually see alternatives to what's currently available to, to and for their peace. Yeah. And then you uh, start the Afghan Women's Boxing Federation. Yeah, yeah. So the soccer program actually is what helped stimulate that. It, it showed me that there was reception of women's activity in sport. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe the soccer program actually missed its opportunity to market the efficacy sport was having on the identity of Afghanistan. So much of the soccer program and the standouts of the women's soccer program were primarily being used for all these publicity stunts to push narratives around independent films or nonprofit organizations and so on. But no one was using that program to be like, no, no, this isn't about that. This is something much bigger. But I realized soccer wasn't big enough for that. Why? Afghanistan being the most male-dominated activity known to mankind, I'm sorry, one of the most male-dominated societies of all time, I, I thought like, look, boxing is the most male-dominated activity of all time. And if I can activate this program in particular, I think it would change the entire social landscape of the world's perspective on Afghanistan being ready for social change. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking about what is it I can do that's uh, non-political, but can make the biggest political uh, noise. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew no one would ever really see the correlations between boxing and then identity of women's uh, oppression and the reality of that in a nation like Afghanistan. So the Women's Boxing Federation was my way of wanting to prove to the world that Afghanistan was ready for social change. That's and, awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And of course, empowering people in, in, in a lot of different ways, which is the title of your book. Oh, there you go. And so you do the Afghanistan things. How many years were you there in Afghanistan doing that? About four and a half years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Once I got this women's boxing program set and I was able to do this one very particular part of the story of that women's boxing program that was the most defining to me around the significance and the value of communication, which really changed my approach to life, where mm -hmm. I saw the power of communication was when I was able to get the Taliban to support the women's boxing program. Oh, wow. Wow. The Taliban were the ones that I was told by everybody in the country that were going to skin me and behead me, take your American ways and go out of here with this idea about women's boxing. Mm -hmm. And the more I would explain what I just explained to you and to the viewers here about why the boxing program, it actually started making sense to the, what the America, what the West would call warlords. I call them tribal elders. Mm -hmm. um, and I went down a list of these folks that I shared this perspective with and this intention with, and they were all extremely supportive, surprisingly to everybody else, but not to me, because I knew the intention was so powerful that you'd have to be an idiot to not be like, okay, good, I got to be behind this. And as that kind of went on, the last one I, I connected with was actually Ahmad Mutawakil, Ahmad Muhammad Mutawakil, who was the uh, chief spokesperson and, and foreign minister of the re Taliban regime. Mm -hmm. And he was the last meeting I had that I really just needed that stamp of approval in order to get this program to actually be registered as a federation under the National Olympic Committee. Oh, wow. And uh, we ended up spending some good time together and had a really good, thorough conversation. And I was extremely surprised, not with his reception. I knew it would take me time, but I didn't know I'd get it as fast as to where he was extremely supportive about this and had relayed to him. I said, I would relay this message to know that none of us will ever get in the way of this program. This is a very symbolic movement. Our women need this, our country needs this, and the world needs this. That is awesome, man. That and is I actually, awesome. I actually recorded that. He let me video our, our conversation. Mm-hmm. So it was when I got that, I, and then I was able to relay that message to the National Olympic Committee and, and, and to the community, primarily to the, the, the small batch of girls that actually stepped up to be a part of this movement with me. The relief and the excitement was one of the best ever. And, and yeah. at that point, I said, good, my, my job here in Afghanistan is done. And got the Federation activated, got the Federation, started the club, built the facility inside of the Olympic Stadium where they used to actually have their public executions, just as a statement. Wow, that's a definite flip. Yeah. And then after that, I just was like, great. Like now I know what it takes to, to help folks understand potential. Mm -hmm. And that, that boot camp in Afghanistan really put me on, on, on path to do what I had done since. And it led to this amazing uh, opportunity with Simon and Schuster in this book. That's awesome, man. That's proof positive of your techniques and work. And on top of everything you've done with NFL players, you talk about the science and case studies around the efficacy of sport and physical activity to help mitigate threats 
of mental and emotional health disorders. Tell us what that means to you and what that's about. So internally, I, I, I run this process um, called the game plan. Mm -hmm. And every single group, firm, agency, company, or individual that wants to become a, a client or a teammate, they have to go through this onboarding process called a game. I call it a game plan because if I called it what it really was, people wouldn't show up. <laughs> And, and because it's me and everything I've been involved with physically, they think when you say game plan, they think it's like a physical game plan, right? Like weight training and nutrition and so on. And the game plan is actually just a very honest conversation. Mm -hmm. And the whole intention of my game plans are really trying to get down to the depth of how folks define what's preventing them um, from being at a state of contentment. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting that 100% of the time, every single game plan I've done over the last 16, 17 years, every single individual has said the exact same thing. And it's been the, it's been the fear, the, it's the judgment, it's the uncertainty, it's the things we don't know. And then I ask, you know, what is the ultimate unknown? And what's the worst thing that could happen? What do you think everybody says? Uh, they die. Thank you. And, and, and Chris, when they say, when, when folks say death for me, my confidence just goes poof, because I'm like, great, this is perfect. And, go, and, they, and they go, why are you celebrating that? I said, because now I know I have a place in your life. And they say, how so? I said, death isn't an unknown. Death is actually the only guarantee. You know, death is the only thing that's happening for sure. That and taxes. Right? That <laughs> depends on what country you're in. And, and what happens with these game plans is I actually start to frame their entire development and their entire perspective and mentality and, and narratives around the consciousness of death. Wow. And they ask me, why are you so obsessed with death? And I'm like, because it's the only real thing that's happening. And if you think about it, right, everything you do in this world, everything you do in this world, those are the uncertains, those are the unknowns, but you tackle it with confidence. Yeah. But the only thing that's 100% certain, you're doing everything in your life to avoid even thinking about it. Yeah. And we've had this whole hashtag we've had for years, which, are, which we've always been called the not normal versus the normal. Uh -huh. and what really separates the normal from the not normal mentality is what we prepare for. Uh -huh. And my stable and I, and I'm hoping the readers of, of this book really start being able to shift into this not normal category of individuals that actually prepare for in making their entire existence around preparation for that moment, that last moment. Hmm. And what is it about that last moment that's so important is when I ask again in these game plans, what is it that you take to your grave when you die? What hmm. do you think everybody says? What would you say? I would say it's going to be the things that were important to you, probably emotionally, your memories. My, For me, it's my dog children. Some of the experiences I had in life, it's not going to be about money or anything I built or any how much I made per hour. It's not going to be any of that. It's going to be the choice memories that I have of what I did in life and who I interacted with that was important to me, I suppose. Fantastic. And if you think about that and package that, mm -hmm. all of that leads to an outcome. And that outcome mm. is a feeling. Mm -hmm. So the easy answer to the question is at the end of the day, all we all take to our graves at the end of the day is an accumulation of our life's feelings. Oh, that's interesting. You literally take your last breath with a feeling. Never thought about that. And we really complicate peace. Mm -hmm. Peace doesn't have to be that complicated because if you contribute every single act and intention and association to contribute to that feeling that you're going to have on your last breath, you could live a lot more off than, than most. Yeah. Yeah? You'll stop procrastinating. You'll be more forgiving. You'll actually love yourself. You'll love more. And it really, I think the mentality alone just humbles tremendously the human. And I think the more humble we become and the more conscious we become of these things, we actually act on what we also try to avoid, which is nerves. Yeah. And why I think nerves are so important are nerves actually get us to think and act on every asset and resource we have. At the end of the day, this thing... Primarily, these case studies really led that to me that folks actually look at fear as a disease mm. that is preventing them from contentment, preventing them from optimization, preventing them from love, preventing them from opportunities. And I, I do believe that fear is a hundred percent disease if, yeah. if you allow it to be. If you allow it to be that responsibility, you're giving it. But the reality mm. is, from my perspective, fear only exists for you to embrace it. Mm -hmm. You know, because embracing it is what, what forces you to 
prove to yourself that you have the capability of actually being able to leverage this and use this. It just mm-hmm. stimulates consciousness. Yeah. So what we've been doing uh, over the last you know 16 years with 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 these game plans and and these case studies, which are you know, these game plans are what we refer to, is, is taking this um, and applying this mentality. You know, obviously, I did it as a community in Afghanistan and, and youth, and then tribal elders, and then when I came to the U.S., it was primarily building my brand a bit. Uh, around this philosophy through my teammates, through Jake Shields and all of his success as an MMA legend. Marshawn Lynch, Tom Cable, my mentor, was the first to give me a shot at 24, 25 years old with the Oakland Raiders when he was the head coach. Mm. Primarily on this, he goes, you'll figure it out. Not like you better do this, you better do that. He just trusted the intention of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was all of these little proof points of individuals that actually gave me the confidence of actually starting to organize this organization. And as we evolved in in 2011 and 12, integrating this mentality and these game plans corporate wide, where we would go into companies and challenge their, their sales performance times, their absenteeism, their product development times. And we'd actually compare our methodology and philosophy to work outcomes and prove the science that way. That is awesome, man. I can totally attest to that. I grew up uh, in a cult and I watched a lot of people, especially from dogma, there were always a fear of the one thing The a lot of it revolves around the fear of why are we here? And when we die, what happens after we die? And a lot of fear of death, really, when it comes down to it. I watched my father, especially in his later years, always afraid of death, but he never lived his life. And one of the reasons that I see a lot of people, especially if they're in a dogma, because they put off so much of the wonderful things that are in life. And that's bad. This is bad. That's bad. Because some, I don't know, some puppet master in the sky said some masochist sadist. And they don't live their lives because they're they're putting it off to some post-life or something, or they're hoping that's there. And they're betting the whole gamble on that. And the fear comes because they don't want to die. They haven't lived their life. They've missed out on things in their life. And they're, I, and I realized you know, my dad, especially at the end for the last five <clears throat> years, he was really fighting not to die. And he was so afraid. And I, I could really feel inside of him and, and other people I've studied this with that they're afraid of death because they haven't lived their life. They realize they've wasted a lot of it. Or maybe deep down, they realize subconsciously they've wasted a lot of it. And for me, I came to the resolution that, okay, and this very early on, I took this on. And there was a guy who I won't won't tell you who quoted, but he said, there's two things. There's things that happen in life that are very definite. You're born and you die. And it's what happens in between that's the that makes the difference. And so early on, becoming an atheist, I accepted that I'm going to die. And there's a lot of people who have a lot of different opinions about what happens after you die. It's a crapshoot. It's like uh, Karl Marx, it was, or not Karl Marx, but the Marx brothers, Groucho Marx used to do the, uh, who, you had to guess the word in, in his head. And if you didn't guess the right word, what is the lucky thing? You could you'd be a great Catholic and go to church all your life and then die and find out that the, the lottery ticket was Mormons or something. And uh, so you don't know. So I just accepted the fact that I'm going to die someday and I'm going to live my life in a way that if I die tomorrow, I'm happy. I don't have any fear of dying tomorrow. I, whatever, I did my shit. I had my, I had a good time. I lived my life my way. I didn't live in society's way. So I really agree with you on this concept of looking death in the face and not fearing it and then living your life without that. What else really helps is knowing that the person sitting across from you, whether it be on that boardroom or in the cage or the ring or the football field, and you have this type of mental edge of being able to embrace what they're terrified of, also mm-hmm. helps tremendously. And where I go with that is that this, at the end of the day, we, we can't fear death. Yeah. Because think about it, death only happens when it saves you from pain. That's true, I guess. We all worry about that painful sort of long death. But at the same time too, again, this is where practice of, of again, I'm not pushing any religion, I'm a belief system and hope, yeah. right? Is an important practice to have. Because at the end of the day, that's all you're going to depend on in those moments. And if you don't have practice with those things between now and then, you can't depend on that. Yeah. Right? So yeah. this is why the, the belief, the conviction, the, the commitment to building a relationship with hope is also extremely significant to know that, again, like death is only going to happen when it saves you from pain. That's so true. So between now and then, prepare for how you want to feel on that last breath. And how I got to this, and I'll, and I'll stop on this topic, was God bless my father's soul, man. Like, 
that this book was inspired by my father in his mm -hmm. last breath. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started the book with uh, a chapter called Smiling at Death. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father actually took his last breath with a smirk. I hope to smile. I hope to laugh on my way out. He literally took his last breath with a smirk. And like, and, I, and my brothers, and I looked over to my brother. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, well, it's like, I think dad went to heaven. He said, no, nah, dude, he's smiling. I'm like, no, I really think he's, he passed. And my mom puts a mirror in front of his nose, 226 in the morning on January 11th. The book came out the same day my father passed randomly, by the way. My mom goes, yeah, your dad went to heaven. And we all just smirked. And I said, talk about an individual who leaves this world so selfless. Uh -huh. to make it easy on everybody around him because he lived so and that's i told him that night chris i swear to god man his, his body was there everybody was out of the room and i told him i was really really choked up but i couldn't get emotional because of how he had left uh -huh. and i told him i said dad i think your whole purpose in this world the 63 years you're alive was meant for this moment for me to see this yeah and i swear i put the intention out right there that i'm going to relay this message one day and God works in really interesting ways. A couple, four or five yeah. years later, here comes Paul Kicks with ESPN, and then I'm, you know, I'm at Dior with, with Simon and Schuster, and it happened. It's a hell of a journey, man. It's a hell of a journey. I've gone into situations in business where, and sometimes in fights, whether it's lawsuits or something, the more successful you get in business, the more lawsuits you pick up. And it just becomes a money thing. And I just took the attitude, what are you going to do? What's the worst that can happen? You can kill me. Well, I'm fine. Go ahead. Kill me. Like I've lived my life, I've had a good fucking time and I didn't live to the social norms of everybody. I didn't wake up when I was 40 and go, wow, I should have lived my life and let's have a midlife crisis. I had my midlife crisis at 20 so that most men have. To me, I just, I took on that attitude. What are you gonna do, fucking kill me? Like, what do I care? I don't have a wife and kids. You can take me out, no one's gonna miss me. And so having that mindset sometimes put me in some really powerful places to empower me to go, we're going all the way. And when people saw, that I was willing to go all the way. I, there's some stories of me and my father battling when in our teenage years. And once he figured out that I was willing to go all the way to stop his abuse, I he, he had to come to the realization that he'll go farther than I will. And I won. And of course, then he stopped beating me and my siblings. And I, I resonate with that. Anything else we want to touch on in the book before we go out? <clears throat> No, I'm just really hoping that I'm hoping this, this book actually just helps people understand that they, they have the freedom to choose their narrative. I think it's important for them to know that there's a massive community out there of individuals that are okay being not normal. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a massive community of folks and teammates out there you'll have that are always looking to embrace the discomfort. And, and that's really it. I'm really excited about it. I hope, I hope folks enjoy it. And I really can't thank you enough, man, for, for bringing me on. Well, thank you for coming on and writing this amazing book. I know how hard it is. <clears throat> excuse me, to write a book. And what an amazing story, just coming from a life, coming out of a refugee camp and what you built in life. And you're helping empower so many different people. And, and hopefully a lot of people will read the book, of course, and learn to empower themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show. We certainly appreciate it, man. Yeah, I appreciate you too. I hope we can do this again. Let's do it anytime. Give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, so tarikazim.com, T-A-R-E-Q-A-Z-I-M.com. And then also on Instagram, it'll just be at Tarek. It's the at sign, obviously, T-A-R-E-Q. Um, let's connect. There you go. There you go, guys. Check out the book, Order It Up. Just barely came out January 11th, 2022. And is it the 11th already? It's the 12th already. Can you yeah, believe it? Yesterday. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I just got off of CS, so I'm still trying to find my brain off the road. So order up the book, guys. Empower Conquering the Disease of Fear. Definitely get it for your books there. Also, watch the video version of this. Go to youtube.com for chess Chris Foss. Hit the bell notification button. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Foss. See everything we're reading and reviewing there. Go see all the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram as well. See our big LinkedIn. We have a big LinkedIn group of 132,000 people. And then there's also a beautiful new newsletter that's just kicking butt over there. It's crazy. We put it out daily. Anyway, guys, so be sure to tune in for all that stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Stay safe, be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.